tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hello, folks. Fall season will soon be upon us, and that means school for the little ones, Halloween, and all the other frightening things that happen as the nights grow longer. Don't miss the latest episode of Horror Hill with Eric Peabody, with new episodes premiering on Thursdays. And, of course, don't forget Fear from the Heartland with Paul J. McSorley, Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and Drew Blood's Dark Tales. You can find them all at simplyscarypodcast.com, on YouTube, or your favorite podcasting service. Or be sure to visit the chillingtalesfordarknights.com website and become a patron and hear extended episodes from our vast audio archive. Slow down just a little bit. And join us for a scary good time. <laughs> We're waiting for you. <laughs>
I mean, we've heard the term stranger than fiction many times over. But even if aliens and monsters may only be in the world of imagination, for the time being anyway, there's still plenty out there to catch us unawares. I mean, how would you handle it if you suddenly saw demons inside every person you met? Or if your friend of many years is on trial as a longtime scam artist? Well, if you want to hear about those stories and many more, be sure to catch the new season of This Is Actually Happening from Wondery. These are true stories that sound like something straight out of a movie, told to you from people who experienced them. In this upcoming season, you'll hear about a man who accidentally shot someone trying to save his life and got 17 years for it. And that scam artist mentioned before? Well, follow the story of Amanda Riley, told from the eyes of a close friend. Interested in stories too strange to not be true? Then I recommend This Is Actually Happening. Follow This Is Actually Happening on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can listen to This Is Actually Happening ad-free on Wondery+. Plus. <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 13, Episode 19. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Arthur Mocken. Tonight, we'll hear stories of obsessive collectors, awful antiquities, mysterious meetings, and terrifying travels. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail... So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Some people like things. Some people love things. Then, some people just seem to be very, very invested. And they just can't wait to show them to you. But take heed, some collectibles need special care. Without further ado, I present to you the novel of the Iron Maid. I think the most extraordinary event which I can recall took place about five years ago. I was then still feeling my way. I had declared for business and attended regularly at my office but I hadn't succeeded in establishing a really profitable connection, and consequently I had a good deal of leisure time on my hands. I've never thought fit to trouble you with the details of my private life that would be entirely devoid of interest. I must briefly say, however, that I had a numerous circle of acquaintances and was never at a loss as to how to spend my evenings. I was so fortunate as to her friends in most of the ranks of the social order. There's nothing so unfortunate, to my mind, as a specialized circle wherein a certain round of ideas is continually traversed and retraversed. I've always tried to find out new types and persons whose brains contain something fresh to me. One may chance to gain information even from the conversation of city men on an omnibus, Amongst my acquaintance, I knew a young doctor who lived in a far outlying suburb, and I used often to brave the intolerably slow railway journey to have the pleasure of listening to his talk. One night, we conversed so eagerly together over our pipes and whiskey that the clock passed unnoticed, and when I glanced up, I realized with a shock that I had just five minutes in which to catch the last train 
made a dash for my hat and stick, and jumped out of the house and down the steps, and tore at full speed up the street. It was no good, however. There was a shriek of the engine whistle, and I stood there at the station door and saw far on the long, dark line of the embankment a red light shine and vanish, and a porter came down and shut the door with a bang. How far to London? I asked him. A good nine miles to Waterloo Bridge, and with that he went off. Before me was the long suburban street, its dreary distance, marked by rows of twinkling lamps, and the air was poisoned by the faint, sickly smell of burning bricks. It was not a cheerful prospect by any means, and I had to walk through nine miles of such streets, deserted as those of Pompeii. I knew pretty well what direction to take. So I set out wearily, looking at the stretch of lamps vanishing in perspective. And as I walked, street after street branched off to the right and left, some far-reaching to distances that seemed endless, communicating with other systems of thoroughfare, and some more protoplasmic streets, beginning in orderly fashion with serried two-story houses, ending suddenly in a waste and pits and rubbish heaps and fields, hence the magic had departed. I've spoken of systems of thoroughfare, and I assure you that, walking alone through these silent places, I felt fantasy growing on me, and some glamour of the infinite. There was here, I felt, an immensity as in the outer void of the universe. I passed from unknown to unknown, my way marked by lamps like stars, and on either hand was an unknown world where myriads of men dwelt and slept, straight leading into street, as it seemed to world's end. At first, the road by which I was traveling was lined with houses of unutterable monotony, a wall of gray brick pierced by two stories of windows, drawn close to the very pavement. But by degrees, I noticed an improvement were gardens, and these grew larger. The suburban builder began to allow himself a wider scope, and for a certain distance each flight of steps was guarded by twin lines of plaster, and scents of flowers prevailed over the fume of heated bricks. The road began to climb a hill, and looking up a side street, I saw the half-moon rise over plane trees. There on the other side was as if a white cloud had fallen and the air around it was sweetened as with incense. It was a may tree in full bloom. I pressed on stubbornly, listening for the wheels and the clatter of some belated hansom. But into that land of men who go to the city in the morning and return in the evening, the hansom rarely enters, and I resigned myself once more to the walk, when I suddenly became aware that someone was advancing to meet me along the sidewalk. The man was strolling rather aimlessly, and though the time and place would have allowed for an unconventional style of dress, he was vested in the ordinary frock coat, black tie, silk hat of civilization. We met each other under the lamp, and, as often happens in this great town, two casual passengers brought face to face found each in the other an acquaintance. Mr. Matthias, I think, I said. Quite so. And you are Frank Burton. You know, you're a man with a Christian name, so I won't apologize for my familiarity. But may I ask, where are you going? I explained the situation to him, saying I had traversed the region, as unknown to me as the darkest recesses of Africa. I think I only have about five miles farther, I concluded. Nonsense. You must come home with me. My house is close by. In fact, I was just taking my evening walk when we met. Come along, I dare say. You will find a makeshift bed easier than a five-mile walk. I let him take my arm and lead me along, though I was a good deal surprised at so much geniality from a man who was, after all, a mere casual club acquaintance. I suppose I had not spoken to Mr. Matthias half a dozen times. He was a man who would sit silent in the armchair for hours, neither reading nor smoking, but now and again moistening his lips with his tongue and smiling queerly to himself. I confess he had never attracted me, 
and on the whole I should have preferred to continue my walk. But he took my arm and led me up a side street and stopped at a door in a high wall. We passed through the still moonlit garden beneath the black shadow of an old cedar and into an old red brick house with many gables. I was tired enough, and I sighed with relief as I let myself fall into the great leather armchair. You know the infernal grit with which they strew the sidewalk in those suburban districts? It makes walking a penance, and I felt my four-mile tramp had made me more weary than ten miles on an honest country road. I looked about the room with some curiosity. It was a shaded lamp which threw a circle of brilliant light on a heap of papers lying on an old brass-bound secretaire of the last century. But the room was all vague and shadowy, and I could only see that it was long and low, and that it was filled with indistinct objects, which might be furniture. Mr. Matthias sat down in a second armchair and looked about him with that odd smile of his. He was a queer-looking man, clean-shaven and white to the lips. I should think his age was something between fifty and sixty. Now I've got you here, he began. I must inflict my hobby on you. You knew I was a collector. Oh, yes, I've devoted many years to collecting curiosities, which I think are really curious. But we must have a better light. He advanced into the middle of the room and lit a lamp, which hung from the ceiling, and as the bright light flashed around the wick, from every corner in space there seemed to start a horror. Great wooden frames with complicated apparatus of ropes and pulleys stood against the wall. A wheel of strange shape had a place beside a thing that looked like a gigantic gridiron. Little tables glittered with bright steel instruments, carelessly put down as if ready for use. A screw and vice loomed out, casting ugly shadows. And in another look was a saw with a cruel jagged edge. Yes, Mr. Matthias said. They are, as you suggest, instruments of torture, of torture and death. Some, many, I may say, have been used. A few are reproductions after ancient examples. Those knives were used for flaying. That frame is a rack and a very fine specimen. Look at this. It comes from Venice. You see that sort of collar, something like a big horseshoe? Well, the patient, let us call him, sat down quite comfortably, and the horseshoe was fitted neatly around his neck. Then the two ends were joined with a silken band. The executioner began to turn a handle connected with the band. The horseshoe contracted very gradually as the band tightened, and the turning continued till the man was strangled. It all took place quietly in one of those queer garrets under the leads. But these things are all European. The Orientals are, of course, much more ingenious. These are the Chinese contrivances. Have you heard of the heavy death? It's my hobby, this sort of thing. Do you know, I often sit here hour after hour, and meditate over the collection. I fancy I see the faces of the men who have suffered, faces lean with agony and wet with sweats of death, growing distinct out of the gloom. And I hear the echoes of their cries for mercy. But I must show you my latest acquisition. Come into the next room. I followed Mr. Matthias out, the weariness of the walk, the late hour, and the strangeness of it all it made me feel like a man in a dream. Nothing would have surprised me very much. The second room was, as the first, crowded with ghastly instruments. But beneath the lamp was a wooden platform, and a figure stood on it. It was a large statue of a naked woman, fashioned in green bronze. The arms were stretched out, and there was a smile on the lips. It might well have been intended for a Venus... And yet there was about the thing an evil and deadly look. Mr. Matthias looked at it complacently. Quite a work of art, isn't it? He said. It's made of bronze, as you see, but it has had the name of Iron Maid. I got it from Germany, and it was only unpacked this afternoon. Indeed, 
I've not yet had time to open the letter of advice. You see that very small knob between the breasts? Well, the victim was bound to the maid. The knob was pressed, and the arms slowly tightened around the neck. Can you imagine the result? As Mr. Matthias talked, he patted the figure affectionately. I had turned away, for I sickened at the sight of the man and his loathsome treasure. There was a slight click, of which I took no notice. It was not much louder than the tick of a clock. And then I heard a sudden whir, the noise of machinery in motion, and I faced round. I've never forgotten the hideous agony on Matthias' face as those relentless arms tightened around his neck. It was a wild struggle as of a beast in the toils, and then a shriek that ended in a choking groan. The whirring noise had suddenly changed into a heavy droning. I tore with all my might at the bronze arms and strove to wrench them apart, but I could do nothing. The head had slowly bent down, and the green lips were on the lips of Matthias, of course, I had to attend the inquest. The letter which had accompanied the figure was found unopened on the study table. The German firm of dealers cautioned their client to be most careful in touching the Iron Maid, as the machinery had been put in thorough working order. I hope you enjoyed the novel of The Iron Maid by Arthur Malkin as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can find his work in collections both past and present. Born in Wales in the late 1800s, Machen was the pen name for Arthur Llewellyn Jones, who would become a notable author of The Strange and Mysterious, both in fact and fiction and outside of it. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looked like fun at first. Probably even threw in a free phone. But now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills, like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, guess what? It's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just $15 a month. You know the prices are going up. I know the prices are going up. But when will they stop? Well, folks, I can assure you the guessing game is over because Mint Mobile doesn't want your prices going up. Imagine, talk, text, and high-speed data for just $15 a month. And you don't even have to lose your contacts or your phone number. No more worries about your increasing bills, hidden fees, and the most dreaded expense of all, those pesky overages that strike when you least expect them. I know you can find what's right for you with Mint Mobile today. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. While less of a household name these days than H.P. Lovecraft, who was heavily influenced by Machen, his is a reputation that is not to be underestimated. One of his most famous works is The Great God Pan, which caused quite a stir on its initial publication for its content both horrific and degenerate, as it was referred to at the time. If you haven't given him a little glance, perhaps now would be a good time to check don't you think? Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Some might call that ending quite an interesting way to go. All I can say is that house, it 
be lucky to escape with your life if you ever remove that do not remove tag on the furniture. But sometimes the collectibles aren't themselves dangerous. They might be alluring and have a somewhat wider appeal. The problem, then, isn't the collection, but the people who appreciate fine rarities and what lengths they might go to obtain them. Without further ado, I present to you the history of the young man with spectacles. From the filthy and obscure lodging situated, I verily believe, in one of the foulest slums of Clerkenwell, I indict this history of a life which, daily threatened, could not last for very much longer. Every day, nay, every hour, I know too well my enemies are drawing their nets closer to me. But now I'm condemned to a closed prison here in my squalid room. I know that when I go out I shall go to my destruction. This history, if it chance to fall into good hands, may perhaps be of service in warning young men of the dangers and pitfalls that most surely must accompany any deviation from the ways of rectitude. My name is Joseph Walters. When I came of age, I found myself in possession of a small but sufficient income, and I determined that I would devote my life to scholarship. I do not mean the scholarship of these days. I had no intention of associating myself with men whose lives are spent in the unspeakably degrading occupation of editing classics, befouling the fair margins of the Ferris books with idle and superfluous annotation, and doing their utmost to give a lasting disgust of all that is beautiful. An abbey church turned to the base use of a stable or a bakehouse is a sorry sight, but more pitiable still is a masterpiece spluttered over with the commentator's pen and his hideous mark, C.F. For my part, I chose the glorious career of scholar in its ancient sense. I long to possess encyclopedic learning, to grow old amongst books, to distill day by day and year after year the inmost sweetness of all worthy writings. I was not rich enough to collect a library, and I was, therefore, forced to betake myself to the reading room of the British Museum. O dim, far-lifted and mighty dome, mecca of many minds, mausoleum of many hopes, sad house where all desires fail. For there men enter in with hearts uplifted and dreaming minds, seeing in those exalted stairs a ladder to fame in that pompous portico, the gate of knowledge, and going in, find but vain vanity, and all but in vain. There, when the long streets are ringing, is silence, their eternal twilight, and the odor of heaviness. But there the blood flows thin and cold, and the brain burns a dust. There is the hunt of shadows, and the chase of embattled phantoms, a striving against ghosts, in a war that has no victory. O dome, tomb of the quick, surely in thy galleries, where no reverberant voice can call, sighs whisper ever, and the mutterings of dead hopes. There men's souls mount like moths toward the flame, and fall scorched and blackened beneath thee, O dim, far-lifted, and mighty dome. Italy do I now regret the day when I took my place at a desk for the first time and began my studies. I had not been a habitué of the place for many months when I became acquainted with a serene and benevolent gentleman, a man somewhat past middle age, who nearly always occupied a desk next to mine. In the reading room, it takes little to make an acquaintance, a casual offer of assistance, a hint as to the search in the catalogue, and the ordinary politeness of men who constantly sit near each other. It was thus I came to know the man calling himself Dr. Lipsius. By degrees I grew to look for his presence, and to miss him when he was away, as was sometimes the case, and so a friendship sprang up between us. His immense range of learning was placed freely at my service. He would often astonish me, 
by the way in which he would sketch out in a few minutes the bibliography of a given subject. And before long, I had confided to him my ambitions. Ah, he said, you should have been a German. I was like that myself when I was a boy. It was a wonderful resolve, an infinite career. I will know all things. Yes, it is a deceit indeed. But it means this, a life of labor without end, and a desire unsatisfied at last. The scholar has to die, and die saying, I know very little. Gradually, by speeches such as these, Lipsius seduced me. He would praise the career, and at the same time hint that it was as hopeless as the search for the philosopher's stone. And so, by artful suggestions, insinuate with infinite address, he by degrees, succeeding in undermining all my principles. After all, he used to say, the greatest of all sciences, the key to all knowledge, is the science and art of pleasure. Rabelais was perhaps the greatest of all the encyclopedic scholars, and he, as you know, wrote the most remarkable book that was ever written. And what does that, that he teach men in this book? Surely the joy of living. I need not remind you of the words suppressed in most of the editions, the key of all of the Rabelaisian mythology, of all the enigmas of his grand philosophy, Vive Joyeux. There you have all his learning. His work is the institutes of pleasure as the fine art. The finest art there is, the art of all arts. Rabelais had all science, but he had all life too. And we've gone a long way since his time. You are enlightened, I think. You do not consider all the petty rules and the bylaws that a corrupt society has made for its own selfish convenience as the immutable decrees of the eternal. Such were the doctrines that he preached, and it was by such insidious arguments, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that he at least succeeded in making me a man at war with the whole social system. I used to long for some opportunity to break the chains and to live a free life, be my own rule and measure. I viewed existence with the eyes of a pagan, and Lipsius understood to perfection the art of stimulating the natural inclinations of a young man, hitherto a hermit. As I gazed up at the great dome, I saw it flushed with the flames and colors of a world of enticement. Unknown to me, my imagination played me a thousand wanton tricks, and the forbidden drew me as surely as a lodestone draws on iron. At last, my resolution was taken, and I boldly asked Lipsius to be my guide. He told me to leave the museum at my usual hour, half past four, to walk slowly along the northern pavement of Great Russell Street, and to wait at the corner of the street till I was addressed, and then to obey in all things the instructions of the person who came up to me. I carried out these directions, and stood at the corner looking about me anxiously, my heart beating fast, and my breath coming in gasps. I waited there for some time, and had begun to fear that I had been made the object of a joke, suddenly became conscious of a gentleman who was looking at me with evident amusement from the opposite pavement of Tottenham Court Road. He came over and, raising his hat, lightly begged me to follow him, and I did so without a word, wondering where we were going and what was to happen. I was taken to a house of quiet and respectable aspect in a street lying to the north of Oxford Street, and my guide rang the bell and a servant showed us into a large room, quietly furnished, on the ground floor. We sat there in silence for some time, and I noticed that the furniture, though unpretending, was extremely valuable. There were large oak presses, two bookcases of extreme elegance, and in one corner a carved chest which must have been medieval. Presently Dr. Lipsius came in and welcomed me with his usual manner, and after some desultory conversation. My guide left the room. Then an elderly man dropped in and began talking to Lipsius. And from their conversation, I understood that my friend was a dealer in antiques, 
They spoke of the Hittite seal and of the prospects of further discoveries. And later, when two or three more persons had joined us, there was an argument as to the possibility of a systematic exploration of the pre-Celtic monuments in England. I was, in fact, present at an archaeological reception of an informal kind, and at nine o'clock, when the antiquaries were gone, I stared at Lipsius in a manner that showed I was puzzled and sought an explanation. Now, he said, we will go upstairs. As we passed up the stairs, Lipsius, lighting the way with a hand lamp, I heard the sound of a jarring lock and bolts and bars shot on at the front door. My guide drew back in a baize door. We went down a passage, and I began to hear odd sounds, a noise of curious mirth. Then he pushed me through a second door, and my initiation began. I cannot write down what I witnessed that night. I cannot bear to recall what went on in those secret rooms, fast shuttered, and curtains so that no light should escape into the quiet street. Now, hold on a minute, folks. I just heard a few things that just can't be true. No one could possibly have 21 different identities, could they? Or could fool people for years, even close friends and relatives, playing a long con. And it's certainly only in fiction, where people are actually seeing demons inside the people they meet. Oh, wait a minute. Turns out these stories actually are true despite how strange they actually sound. These, and more, are part of the new season of Strange But True Tales available on This Is Actually Happening. Presented by Wondery, This Is Actually Happening is a podcast exploring these stories that sound as if they couldn't be true, but are brought to you by the people who were there when they happened. Not only will you catch the story of one of the friends of notable scammer Amanda Riley, but there are even more. But the 17-year sentence for the man who accidentally shot someone trying to save his life. Just ask yourself, was that story you heard true? Well, if you're not sure, I recommend you listen to This Is Actually Happening and remove any and all doubts. Follow This Is Actually Happening on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcast. And you can listen to This Is Actually Happening ad-free on Wondery Plus. They gave me red wine to drink, and a woman told me as I sipped it that it was the wine of the red jar that Avalonius had made. Another asked me how I liked the wine of the Fowns, and I heard a dozen fantastic names, while the stuff boiled in my veins and stirred, I think, something that had slept within me from the moment I was born. It seemed as if my self-consciousness deserted me. I was no longer a thinking agent, but at once subject and object. I mingled in the horrible sport and watched the mystery of the Greek groves and fountains enacted before me, saw the reeling dance, heard the music calling as I sat beside my mate, and yet I was outside it all, and viewed my own part an idle spectator. Thus, with strange rites, they made me drink the cup, and when I woke up in the morning, I was one of them, and had sworn to be faithful. At first, I was shown the enticing side of things. I was bidden to enjoy myself and care for nothing but pleasure, and Lipsius himself indicated to me as the acutest enjoyment, the spectacle of the terrors of the unfortunate persons who were, from time to time, decoyed into the evil house. But after a time, it was pointed out to me that I must take my share in the work, and so I found myself compelled to be, in my turn, a seducer. And thus, it is on my conscience that I have led many to the depths of the pit. One day, Lipsius summoned me to his private room and told me, that he had a difficult task to give me. He unlocked a drawer and gave me a sheet of typewritten paper and bade me read it. It was without place or date or signature and ran as follows. Mr. James Headley, FSA, 
will receive from his agent in Armenia on the 12th a unique coin, the Gold Tiberius. It bears on the reverse a thorn with the legend Victoria. It is believed that this coin is of immense value. Mr. Headley will come up to town to show the coin to his friend, Professor Mimis of the Shinnis Street, Oxford Street, on some date between the 13th and the 18th. Dr. Lipsius chuckled at my face of blank surprise when I laid down this singular communication. You will have a good chance of showing your discretion, he said. This is not a common case. It requires great management and infinite tact. Sure, I wish I had an urge in my service, but we'll see what we can do. But is it not a joke? I asked him. How can you know, or rather, how can this correspondent of yours know, that a coin has been dispatched from Armenia to Mr. Headley? How is it possible to fix the period in which Mr. Headley will take into his head to come up to town? Seems to me a lot of guesswork. My dear Mr. Walters, he replied, we do not deal in guesswork here. It would bore you if I went into all the little details, the cogs and wheels, if I may say so, which move a machine. Don't you think it's much more amusing to sit in front of the house and be astonished than to be behind the scenes and see the mechanism? Better tremble at the thunder, believe me, than see the man rolling the cannonball. But... After all, you needn't bother about how and why. You have your share to do. Of course, I shall give you full instructions. But a great deal depends on the way the thing is carried out. I have often heard very young men maintain that style is everything in literature, and I can assure you that the same maxim holds good in our far more delicate profession. With us, style is absolutely everything. That is why we have friends like yourself. I went away in some perturbation. He had no doubt, designedly left everything in mystery, and I did not know what part I should have to play. Though I had assisted at scenes of hideous revelry, I was not yet dead to all echo of human feeling, and I trembled lest I should receive the order to be Mr. Edley's executioner. A week later was on the 16th of the month, Dr. Lipsius made me a sign to come into his room. It is for tonight, he began. Please to attend carefully to what I am going to say, Mr. Walters, and on peril of your life, for it is a dangerous matter. On peril of your life, I say, follow these instructions to the letter. You understand? Well, tonight... At about half past seven, you will stroll quietly up the Hempstead Road till you come to Vincent Street. Turn down here and walk along, taking the third turning to your right, which is Lambert Terrace. Then follow the terrace, cross the road, and go along Hertford Street, and so into Lenlington Square. The second turning will come into the square that's called Sheen Street. But in reality, it's more than a passage between blank walls and a street. Whatever you do, take care to be at the corner of this street at eight o'clock precisely. You will walk along it, and just at the bend, where you lose sight of the square, you'll find an old gentleman with white beard and whiskers. He will, in all probability, be abusing a cabman for having him been brought to Sheen Street instead of Chenise Street. Go up to him quietly and offer your services. He will tell you where he wants to go, and you will be so courteous as to offer to show him the way. I may say that Professor Mimis moved into Chene Street a month ago. Thus, Mr. Headley has never been to see him there. And moreover, he is very short-sighted and knows little of the topography of London. Indeed, he has quite lived the life of a learned hermit at Audley Hall. Well, need I say more to a man of your intelligence? You will bring him to this house. You will ring the bell, and a servant in quiet livery will let him in. Then your work will be done, and I am sure done well. You will leave Mr. Headley at the door and simply continue your walk, 
and I shall hope to see you the next day. I really don't think there's anything more I can tell you. These minute instructions I took care to carry out to the letter. I confess that I walked up to the Tottenham Court Road by no means blindly, but with an uneasy sense that I was coming to a decisive point in my life. The noise and rumor of that crowded pavement were to me but dumb show. I revolved again and again in ceaseless iteration the task that had been laid upon me, and I questioned myself as to the possible results. As I got near the point of turning, I asked myself whether danger were not about my steps. The cold thought struck me that I was suspected and observed. Every chance foot passenger who gave me a second glance seemed to me an officer of police. My time was running out. The sky had darkened, and I hesitated, half resolved to go no further, but to abandon Lipsius and his friends forever. I had almost determined to take this course, when the conviction suddenly came to me that the whole thing was a gigantic joke, a fabrication of rank and probability. Who could have procured the information about the Armenian agent, I asked myself, and by what means could Lipsius have known that particular day? and the very train that Mr. Headley was to take. How to engage him to enter one special cab amongst the dozens waiting at Paddington. I vowed it a mere Milesian tale. I went forward merrily and turned down Vincent Street and threaded out the route that Lipsius had so carefully impressed upon me. The various streets he'd named were all places of silence and an oppressive cheap gentility. It was dark and I felt alone in the musty squares and crescents, where people pattered by at intervals and the shadows were growing blacker. I entered Sheen Street and found it, as Lipsius had said, more a passage than a street. It was a byway, on one side a low wall, on neglected gardens, and grim backs of lines of houses, and on the other a timber yard. I turned the corner and lost sight of the square. Then, to my astonishment, I saw the scene of which I had been told. A handsome cab had come to stop beside a pavement, and an old man carrying a handbag was fiercely abusing the cabman, who sat on his perch, the image of bewilderment. Yes, but I'm sure you said Sheen Street, and that's where I brought you, I heard him saying as I came up. The old gentleman boiled in a fury threatened police in suits at law. The sight gave me a shock, and in an instant I resolved to go through with it. I strolled on, and without noticing the cabin, lifted my hat politely to old Mr. Edley. Pardon me, sir, I said, but is there any difficulty? I see you're a traveler. Perhaps the cabin has made a mistake. Can I direct you? The old fellow turned to me, and I noticed that he snarled showed his teeth like an ill-tempered cur as he spoke. This drunken fool has brought me here, he said. I told him to drive me to Chenise Street, and he brings me to this infernal place. I won't pay him a farthing, and I meant to have given him a handsome sum. I'm going to call for the police and give him in charge. At this threat, the cabman seemed to take alarm. He glanced round as if to make sure that no policeman was in sight, and drove off, grumbling loudly. And Mr. Edley grinned savagely with the satisfaction of having saved his fare, and put back one and sixpence into his pocket, the handsome sum the cabman had lost. "'My dear sir,' I said, "'I'm afraid this piece of stupidity has annoyed you a great deal. "'It's a long way to Chenise Street.' I'll have some difficulty in finding the place, unless you know London pretty well. I know it very little, he replied. I never come up except on important business, and I've never been to Chenise Street in my life. Really? I should be happy to show you the way. I've been for a stroll, and it will not at all inconvenience me to take you to your destination. I want to go to Professor Memis at number 15. It's most annoying to me. I'm short-sighted, and I can never make out the numbers of the doors. This way, if you please, I said, and we set out. 
did not find Mr. Headley an agreeable man. Indeed, he grumbled the whole way. He informed me of his name, and I took care to say, as a well-known antiquary. And thenceforth, I was compelled to listen to the history of his complicated squabbles with publishers, who had treated him, as he said, disgracefully. The man was a chapter in the irritability of authors. He told me that he had been on the point of making the fortune of several firms, but had been compelled to abandon the design owing to their rank ingratitude. Besides these ancient histories of wrong and the more recent misadventure of a cabin, he had another grievous complaint to make. As he came along in the train, he had been sharpening a pencil the sudden jolt of the engine, as it drew upon the station, had driven the penknife against his face, inflicting a small triangular wound just on the cheekbone, which he showed me. He denounced the railway company, and heaped imprecations on the head of the driver, and talked of claiming damages. Thus he grumbled all the way, not noticing in the least where he was going, and so unamiable did his conduct appear to me that I began to enjoy the trick I was playing on him. Nevertheless, my heart beat a little faster as we turned into the street where Lipsius was waiting. A thousand accidents, I thought, might happen. Some chance might bring one of Headley's friends to meet us. Perhaps, though he knew not Chenise Street, he might know the street where I was taking him. In spite of his short sight, might possibly make out the number, and in a sudden fit of suspicion, he might make an inquiry of the policeman at the corner. Thus, every step upon the pavement as we drew nearer to the goal was to me a pang and a terror. Every approaching passenger carried a certain threat of danger. I gulped down my excitement with an effort and made shift to say pretty quietly. Number 15, I think you said. That's the third house from this. If you'll allow me, I'll leave you now. I've been delayed a little, and my way lies on the other side of Tottenham Court Road. I snarled out some kind of thanks, and I turned my back and walked swiftly in the opposite direction. A minute or two later, I looked round and saw Mr. Edley standing on the doorstep. And then the door opened, and he went in. For my part, I gave a sigh of relief and hastened to get away from the neighborhood and endeavored to enjoy myself in merry company. The whole of the next day I kept away from Lipsius. I felt anxious, but I did not know what had happened or what was happening, and a reasonable regard for my own safety told me that I should do well to remain quietly at home. My curiosity, however, to learn the end of the odd drama, in which I played a part, stung me to the quick and late in the evening I made up my mind to go and see how events had turned out. Lipsius nodded when I came in, and asked me if I could give him five minutes' talk. We went into his room, and he began to walk up and down, and I sat waiting for him to speak. "'My dear Mr. Walters,' he said at length, "'I congratulate you warmly. Your work was done in the most thorough and artistic manner. You will go far. Look!' He went to his escritoire and pressed a secret spring, and a drawer flew out, and he laid something on the table. It was a gold coin. And I took it up and examined it eagerly, and read the legend about the figure of the fawn. Victoria, I said, smiling. Yes, it was a great capture which we owe to you. I had great difficulty in persuading Mr. Headley that a little mistake had been made how I put it. He was very disagreeable, and indeed ungentlemanly about it. Didn't he strike you as a very cross old man? I held the coin, admiring the choice and rare design, clear-cut as if from the mint, and I thought the fine gold glowed and burned like a lamp. And what finally became of Mr. Headley? I said at last. Lepsia smiled and shrugged his shoulders. What on earth does it matter, he said. He might be here, or there, or anywhere. But what possible consequence could it be? Besides, your question rather surprises me. You're an intelligent man, Mr. Walters. Just think it over. 
I'm sure you won't repeat the question. My dear sir, I said, I hardly think you're treating me fairly. You paid me some handsome compliments on my share in the capture, and I naturally wish to know how the matter ended. From what I saw of Mr. Headley, I should think you must have had some difficulty with him. He gave me no answer for the moment, but he began again to walk up and down the room, apparently absorbed in thought. Well, he said at last, I suppose there is something in what you say. We are certainly indebted to you. I have said that I have a high opinion of your intelligence, Mr. Walters. Just look here, will you? He opened a door communicating with another room and pointed. There was a great box lying on the floor, a queer coffin-shaped thing. I looked at it and saw it was a mummy case like those in the British Museum, vividly painted in the brilliant Egyptian colors, with I knew not what proclamation of dignity or hopes of life immortal. The mummy, swathed about in the robes of death, was lying within, and the face had been uncovered. You're going to send this away, I said, forgetting the question I'd put. Yes, I have an order from the local museum. Look a little more closely, Mr. Walters. Puzzled by his manner, I peered into the face while he held up a lamp. The flesh was black with the passing of the centuries, but as I looked, I saw upon the right cheekbone a small triangular star. The secret of the mummy flashed upon me. I was looking at the dead body of the man whom I had decoyed into that house. There was no thought or design of action on my mind, I held the accursed coin in my hand, burning me with a foretaste of hell, and I fled as I would have fled from pestilence and death, dashed into the street in blind horror, not knowing where I went. I felt the gold coin grasped in my clenched fist, and threw it away, I knew not where, and ran on and on through the streets, the by streets, and dark ways, till at last I issued out in a crowded thoroughfare, and checked myself. Then, as consciousness returned, I realized my instant peril, and understood that what would happen if I fell into the hands of Lipsius. I knew that I had put forth my finger to thwart a relentless mechanism rather than a man. My recent adventure with the unfortunate Mr. Headley it taught me that Lipsius had agents in all quarters, and I foresaw that if I fell into his hands, he would remain true to his doctrine of style and cause me to die a death of some horrible and ingenious torture. I bent my whole mind to the task of outwitting him, and his emissaries, three of whom I knew to have proved their ability, were tracking down persons who, for various reasons, preferred to remain obscure. The servants of Lipsius were two men and a woman. The woman was incomparably the most subtle and the most deadly. Yet I considered that I too had some portion of craft and took my resolve. Since then I've matched myself day by day and hour by hour against the ingenuity of Lipsius and his myrmidons. For a time I was successful, though they beat furiously after me in the covert of London, I remained perdu. I watched with some amusement their frantic efforts to recover the scent lost in two or three minutes. Every lure and wow was put forth to entice me from my hiding place. I was informed by the medium of the public prints that what I had taken had been recovered, and meetings were proposed in which I might hope to gain a great deal without the slightest risk. I laughed at their endeavors, and began a little to despise the organization I had so dreaded and ventured more abroad. Not once or twice, but several times, I recognized the two men who were charged with my capture, and I succeeded in eluding them easily at close quarters, and a little hastily I decided that I had nothing to dread and that my craft was greater than theirs. But in the meanwhile, while I congratulated myself on my cunning, a third of Lipsius's emissaries was weaving her nets, 
And in an evil hour, I paid a visit to an old friend, a literary man named Russell, who lived in a quiet street in Bayswater. The woman, as I found out too late, a day or two ago, occupied rooms in the same house. I was followed and tracked down. Too late, as I have said, I recognized that I had made a fatal mistake and that I was besieged. Sooner or later, I shall find myself in the power of an enemy without pity. And so surely as I leave this house, I shall go to receive doom. I hardly dare to guess how it will at last fall upon me. My imagination, always a vivid one, paints to me appalling pictures of the unspeakable torture which I shall probably endure. And I know that I shall die with Lipsius standing near and gloating over the refinements of my suffering and my shame. Hours, nay, minutes, have become very precious to me. I sometimes pause in the midst of anticipating my tortures to wonder whether even now I cannot hit upon some supreme stroke, some design of infinite subtlety, and free myself from the toil but I find that the faculty of combination has left me. I am, as the scholar in the old myth, deserted by the power which has helped me hitherto. I don't know when the supreme moment will come, but sooner or later it is inevitable. Before long I shall receive sentence, and from the sentence to execution will not be long. I cannot remain here a prisoner any longer. I shall go out tonight, when the streets are full of crowds and climbers and make a last effort to escape. I hope you enjoyed the history of the young man with spectacles by Arthur Mockin, as performed by yours truly. If you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author is a prolific, if long deceased, fellow who inspired many of your favorite authors with his love of the weird and supernatural. The great god Pan isn't his only work worth checking out. His story, The White People, about the horrors of dabbling in witchcraft, is also well regarded by many modern horror masters. And several of tonight's stories came from his collected novel, The Three Imposters. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word makes a huge difference and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jari channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jari. Stay tuned as this season is just getting started. Well, really, it's more like halfway through. But any case, until next week, stay spooky get some sleep if you can (laughs) thanks for listening you've been listening to scary stories told in the dark 
a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Chirey. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.